I hope you can. I don't think people can hear that. My name is Ray Kinsler. Uh, I've been working on um, data plane technologies for the last eight or ten years for Intel. Um, um, DPDK, VPP, and I know TLDK uh, to name a few. Uh, today I'm going to talk about T TLDK and why we're, have a, uh, why we're interested in accelerating TCP. Um, So why TCP performance matters? Well, I, I guess really TCP performance is really a heavily a part of user experience. You know, in the wireless network, uh, TCP dominates. TCP makes up about, I think, 95% of traffic in the cellular network. Uh, about 4% is UDP, and uh, the rest of it is in the, the rest of it's in the noise. TCP flows tend to be small, which is problematic means that you, you know, because it's stateful, you go to all the effort of setting up your flows and then only to have the thing, t you know, transfer about four kilobits, sorry, kilobytes, and that's literally the size of a, that's a, literally the size of the very most of the flows, and then to get torn down again. So it's relatively expen expensive in this connection setup and tear down, uh, but most of the flows actually transfer very, very, very little data. You also have other artifacts in TCP, you know, uh, uh, parts of the spec that makes sl small flows even more problematic. Things like TCP slow start, so you may not be familiar with this, but you know, TCP starts off slowly, it'll send one packet and wait for an ACK, and then it'll send two packets and wait for an ACK. That's fine if you've got a very, very, very long connection. But if you're only having a short connection, it can be quite, it can be quite, again, make it even more expensive. There's a similar problem in the wire, in the wireline network, and I found this one pretty interesting, is that peer-to-peer um, -peer is used on a relatively small number of uh, broadband connections. You know, 97% of the connections don't use peer-to-peer, -peer, about 3% of it. Maybe it's just because I know everybody, all my friends use peer-to-peer. -peer. I assumed everybody did, but apparently not. So 97% of connections don't use peer-to-peer. -peer. And of those 97% of connections that don't use peer-to-peer, -peer, about 70 or 70 plus percent of their traffic is, again, HTTP, TCP. So TCP dominates in the wireline network as well. So, okay, it's a huge part of it's a huge part of the equation in wireless networks and wireline networks. So this is where the problems start to creep in. In the wireless is a relatively recent advent compared to, compared to TCP. Wireless is relatively lossy. Your connect your cell phone will be connected and then not connected, and that's perfectly normal. But from TCP, its point of view, it looks like it's lost packets. Things like congestion control, kick in, loss, inversion, those kind of things, they kick in, even though it's a perfectly normal thing for your, for your cell phone to go away. In the wireline network, you have things like impedance mismatch. You might have 100 gigs coming into a box, but only a 100 meg, only a 100 meg DSL line, so then you run into problems like buffer bloat. So you're 
your bulk downloads are crowding out your uh, crowding out your, um, your your web browsing. So if you're doing let's say you're doing let's say video streaming at the same time as you're browsing the web, which is not uncommon these days for people to be flicking around on Twitter, commenting on a TV show while watching the TV show over Netflix. The how well Twitter responds is a key part of UX. Without intervention, the uh, video, the bulk download, is going to cause a very bad user experience for the person uh, flicking around on Twitter. So this has given rise to the advent of user space TCP stacks. People looking, and what you typically see is. Uh, People who are developing applications in the data center, many of them actually develop TCP stacks to go alongside their applications. So if I am, um, you know, one paper that was recently published by Jerry Chu from Google commented that they had something like half a dozen to a dozen individual TCP stacks inside Google. Just simply because people writing an application, they want to have access to new, some t new TCP option, so they'll write their own TCP stack to go alongside, go alongside with their application. And this is this has become a normal pattern. There's lots of examples of the you know, there are lots of examples of this now. What's a very typical uh, design pattern you'll see in this area will be to take an operating system stack like the NetBSD stack, like the FreeBSD stack, and in the case of Jerry Chu, he takes the Linux kernel and run it on top of a fast I/O, fast packet I/O technology like Net, uh, sorry, like um, NetMap or DPDK or OpenFastPath. So you have your fast I/O, and then you run a, you run a well-known kernel stack on top of it. That has some nice advantages. As a design approach, that has some nice advantages. One of us is that you get broad RFC compliance. So typically, all these kernels have a fairly supported, fairly broad set of RFCs, which is pretty, which is pretty nice. The other thing is that it has a BSD socks app, um, BSD socks API. So if I'm taking an off-the-shelf application like an Nginx, everybody's favorite application of choice, but Nginx, the kernel is giving you a BSD SOX API, and it's fairly easy to glue the two together. Also, the to total cost of ownership. So if I'm using a BSD stack or a NetBSD, uh, a BSD stack or a Linux stack on top of DPDK or NetMap, then as security problems emerge upstream, I so I get CVE patches, I get performance fixes, I get maintenance, the, the stack is maintained. So it's a relatively attractive way to implement a user space TCP stack. So along with, a com along with that approach comes with costs. So those kernel stacks make assumptions that they're actually running in the kernel. So you have to jump through some hoops to get those kernel stacks to run and behave themselves in user space. There's a lot of work being done in this area, but the, the kernel threads will make assumptions like that they're uh, running in the kernel and that they're not going to be running in the same context as the user space thread that made the system call to which they're reacting. So it's, you have to jump through some hoops to get these uh, stacks to behave in user space. Uh, typical, things that, typi typical things that people evaluate, look for in a user space TCP stack, and it's very heavily around connections per second. Um, you're fine, but I lost my train of thought. <laughs> So in user space TCP stacks, what really, you'll know, go back to the previous slide, what really gave, gives given rise to the development of user space TCP stacks is the prioritization of performance and optimization. You know, the ability to optimize, to create an optimized TCP stack in user space in which you can really, um, really optimize for use cases like, uh, performance use cases like connections per second, your throughput, your request response latency, where you can, do things like uh, optimize for core locality. So the actual user space application that's processing the bit stream is running on the same core in which the bit stream was received. So that you can do stuff like eliminate context switching. So if I have a, if I'm using the kernel, if I'm using the kernel, I will typically do a select, I'll wait for user input, that uh, I'll wait, sorry, for wait for a packet to arrive. 
that's one context switch, and then I will do a read whenever the packet does arrive, and that's another context switch, and then I figure out it hasn't actually, haven't actually received enough information to do useful, inform useful work, and then I'll do another context switch to do another select to wait for more information to arrive, so lots of context switching. So what is TLDK? Uh, TLDK, it, it's a hot, oh. TLDK is a high-performance layer 4 implementation implemented on top of um, DPDK. It's a complete grounds-up design. So the bottom tree that we kind of, bottom tree points that I talked about in the last slide, you know, the API compatibility and the reuse of, uh, the reuse of a well-known stack that with broad RFC compliance, we don't get those benefits, no, straight up, okay? But what we are doing is we're doing a complete grounds-up design to aim for the highest possible performance that we can achieve on the platform. So that means that we're going to leave some stuff on the table so you won't get the BSD SOX compatible API. You won't get the same level of broad RFC, uh, RFC compliance. But what you will get is you will get the fastest possible TCP implementation that you can build on a general purpose CPU. And that's really what we're aiming, that's what we're really aiming to complain, uh, create. So in the creation of TLDK, we reuse DPDK design concepts. So we uh, do batch processing, improves IPC. We do things like loop and rolling. We, do the, we use vector instructions where, where we can. We, do think we use batch processing to keep the instruction cache warm so that instead of pushing one packet through the stack, you're processing multiple, pa multiple packets at the same time to keep your instruction cache cache warm. We aim for cache coherency so that there's an affinity between a given network device, between the stack that processes the network device, and then also the application that reads the TCP stream that's received on that network device. So we have an end-to-end -end affinity between the network device and the actual application that processes the t TCP stream. Uh, we eliminate things like uh, Oh, yeah. By not transferring the TCP stream between cores, you eliminate things like swapping hash lines and snooping between cores, so it's, it's, it's much more efficient. We eliminate mode switching, obviously, because everything's, uh, everything's in user space at this point every, anyway. So what we're aiming to support is, we're, you know, we're aiming to support UDP and TCP at this point. We're going to support passive and active connections, and that's basically the client and the server model and the bump in the wire model that I'm going to talk about in a while. So one of the use cases I'm very interested in looking at, proving out, proving out TLDK in, is that in bump in the wire performance. Um, we support common TCP options, and there's probably just a list of them here, you know, Zen. MSS timestamp, uh, selective acknowledgements, we support common features. We have a DDoS implementation based on signed cookie. We will look at other DDoS implementation um, mechanisms later. If you don't need DDoS as everything is running inside your data center behind an IDS system anyway, you might want tools to turn DDoS off. We support things like denied acknowledgements. We we'll support congestion control. We also support hot, common hardware offload. So you might choose to use RSS, you might use, choose to use TSS. So you might use, choose to use sign filtering on your, if you're NIC, if you're NIC supported. Now we will use all of these to improve performance, make performance as fast as possible. And then also we're going to provide code examples. So one of the nice things you get with DPDK when, when you download DPDK, you get some nice sample code. I've written some of it myself that actually shows different use cases like L2 forwarding, L, uh, L3 forwarding. We're going to do the same with TLDK. We will have a sample directory that will show off use cases like, transfer, like transparent proxy. And I'll talk about some of those use cases that we would like to show off later. So, so TLDK provides a socket-like API. So uh, it, it's a socket-like, like you'll be familiar with some of the API calls. They're, they will look familiar to you. Um, I, I guess, you know, the naming of it will look familiar, but then when you actually get into the parameters, is that's where the differences start to creep in. So there's three common um, design concepts with TLDK that I want to jump into. Oh, sorry, first one, uh, before we go there. 
it, it, one of the easy reasons people talk about this, we're turning the network stack upside down. What we're really trying to do is make the, the protocol being driven by the application instead of the, so the application driving the protocol instead of the protocol driving the application. So what you sit, typically see with TCP applications is I sit and I wait for a socket. Uh, and then when the socket, when something arrives in the socket, I wake up and I do something, okay? And if I wake up and I, I haven't received enough information on the socket, I will go back to sleep. I'll buffer it and I'll go back to sleep again. And then next time more packets arrive, I'll wake up again. The design paradigm with TLDK is we will continue to do useful work while there is useful work to do. So we will back, so we will do batch processing. So we will batch, we will batch read packets off the network device and then we will batch read and we will iterate through streams and then iterate through packets received on streams. So we will continue to poll and continue to work in the DPDK style, in the batch processing style, and continue to work while, um, while there is useful work to do. We'll never block. So in that way that the application is driving, is driving the protocol, not the protocol driving the application. So three core design con uh, concepts. The first is your context. Your context is really an individual instance of the stack. You typically have one context per core. You might have more than one context per core, that's okay too, but there is an affinity between a, con uh, between a context and a given core. You will then have devices. Now, all we're doing is implementing a layer four implementation. We're not doing a layer two, we're not doing a layer three implementation. You'll get, you'll get those from somewhere else. You might choose to, in many cases, people have their own on top of DPDK that they'll want to use, but all we're doing is a layer four implementation. So in TLDK, it has, a it has a notion of there being a device underneath and that device has capabilities. It may support IP, it may support certain hardware offloads, so you know, TLDK understands that there's an IPv4 implementation, understands there's an IPv6 implementation, understands that some devices support things like TSO and can take advantages of them, but, then, but it doesn't, it, it's not um, tightly coupled to any implementation. It's loosely coupling is achieved by using the TLE abstraction through the TLE device. And then the finally, the last concept is a TLE stream, which is essentially your TCP UDP stream, and that's what the little asterisk is. And that's really your L4 endpoint. It describes, it describes a, um, a source and destination IP address and source and, a, a source and destination port. Um, the last thing I'd say is the streams are actually Ordinarily, you would process a stream on a given core. So you, for the best performance, you want to have that end-to-end -end tight coupling between a device, a context, and a stream on a given core. But the, the API actually, uh, what we call our, um, uh, the, the actual the streaming API is thread safe. So if you did want to write, read and write another stream from another core, that's actually perfectly okay to do. So TLDK has this notion of a front end and a back end, and the, back, the front end is the layer, you can almost think as TLDK as a sandwich in the middle. So the, um, the front end is the API to which you write your application against, and then the back end is basically where your layer two, layer three, and uh, implementation exists. So the backend API, so you might think about at the very, very lowest level, you'll have DPDK or some fast, IO, uh, fast, uh, fast packet IO technology. It receives, you receives the packet, pushes it through your IPv4 implementation or IPv6 implementation, and then you do a bulk RX into TLDK. So you do a bulk push of the packets into TLDK. And then TLDK will take care of the splitting out of the packets into multiple streams. So then in, the, and then in your front end, you will go and iterate, you will go and you'll say, okay, is there any signs for me to process? Is there any signed packets for me to process? Okay, there's some signed packets for me to process. I better go accept the new connections I want to accept or I can reject the new connections I want to reject. Is there any, uh, is there any reset packets I need to process? Yes, there's some reset uh, packets I need to process. I need then to both close those connections, to both close those streams. And then I have API with the kind of semantics you'll be familiar with, like send and receive and read and write. And our, our read and write API support IO vectors, which you know, you'll be familiar with, as send and receive bit streams. 
And um, what I talked about before, then tread safe, like this is typically on the left hand side is the, you know, the most optimal setup where you have a back end and TLDK context and your application, all of which runs on a, uh, all of which runs on a given core. We also support the right hand side where you have a back end and your context on one core, but your actual front end can read and write the stream, read and write the streams from other cores. So this was the bit where I was supposed to well, support, talk about both UDP and TCP performance uh, on, top of TL, on top of TLDK. Well, as will typically happen with these things, that there was a, a whole drag around like Xia licensing costs for the, the, the benchmark TCP. And then there was also an unhappy incident involving a Nerf gun that kind of, uh, that, 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 delayed the whole bit, that, that delayed the whole thing. So I only have UDP performance numbers today. I will talk about, T, I will talk about TCP performance as well in a moment. So UDP performance is about 7 million packets per second, but one thing you'll know, and this is really what we're aiming for, is we're linearly scalable. As you add cores, you get 14 million packets, 21 million, 1 million packets per second. So we're linearly scalable in the same way DPDK applications typically are. As they tip more cores you give, you get the linear scaling, linear scaling in, in performance. Uh, perform our initial target for connections per second is about half a million to one million connections per second per core. That means that we'll be able to work and we're, we have, I have numbers to suggest that we're training positive for that. So that means that you'll be able to set, down and tear, uh, set up and tear down half a million to one million connections per second per core, which is pretty exceptional performance. Okay. Okay. So some of the use cases that we're aiming for. Uh, DPDK workloads are typically proven out first on network nodes, and I don't, hopefully TLDK won't be any exception to this. So we're going to start off at TCP aggregation points in the network, and there's two I find interesting. The first one is transparent, uh, transparent proxies. And transparent proxies are pretty widely de deployed in the cellular network. Transparent proxies are what take care of the fact that stop TCP going nuts when your cell phone disappears and reappears on the cellular network. So what typically happens in the transparent proxy is that it'll watch the sign go by between your cell phone and the server. And then it will create a shadow connection. Once that shadow connection is set up, it, it will do acts on your behalf. So as your cell phone communicates with the server, uh, uh, as a cell phone communicates with the server, it will send acknowledgments when the server returns, send acknowledgments when the, as the server return packets. That means that if your cell phone disappears for a few, milli, for a few milliseconds and it's not there to send the acts, that you know, the server doesn't start resending those packets unnecessarily. And then when your cell phone appears on your network, the TCP, back on the network, the TCP proxy sends on, the, send those, sends on those packets. So it stops things like, uh, it, it stops you know, the typical loss control mechanisms of TCP kicking in. So the one use case, uh, one use case that we're going to uh, go, go after. Another use case that we're going to go after is um, reverse proxy load balancer. So this is more of a data center use case. So in the data center, you typically have a reverse proxy load balancer that sits back, it sits directly behind your front end. And what it does is it terminates HTTPS, it serves up static content itself, and then it forwards uh, on requests for dynamic content uh, to the web servers behind it and then load balances, uh, load balances between them. So again, it is another example of a TCP aggregation point in the network uh, that you know, has stateful requirements. So both TCP, uh, TCP transparent proxy and reverse proxy are kind of on our, on our short term to do list. So in summary, um, network operators and data centers are all optimizing TCP to, re to handle the, to, to improve the user, to improve the end user experience and improve overall utilization, network uh, utilization. 
TCP stacks are growing in popularity. I think I counted 11 TCP stacks on top of, T uh, on top of DPDK and NetMap before I actually wrote, while well, I was in the process of writing this presentation. You're probably familiar with some of them. You have DPDK, ANS, lib 12 net there's, uh, ooh, there's, um, there's a TCP implementation in VPP, there's CSTAR, there's, a, uh, there's MTCP, there's lots and lots of TCP implementations in user space. All of whom are reusing, uh, a lot of whom are reusing the FreeBSD or NetBSD or Linux kernel implementation all of whom are trying to implement the BSD SOX API. That's not where we're going. We're going for the fastest possible TCP performance on top of a general purpose, pro uh, general purpose processor, um, going after network node use cases. If those are things that are interesting to you, I'd love to hear from you. My, con my contact details are in the bottom of the slides. I'm going to be available, after uh, available afterwards. But we'd love to, we're uh, a brand new open source community and we're eager for contributions and be all the feedback telling us we're going the right way or the wrong way or contributing use cases or contributing code. We're very eager, eager for fellow travelers to follow us. Okay. Oh, we have repeat questions. So I have a few minutes for questions if there's any questions. I'm sorry? Do we plan, okay, so the question is, do we plan any MTCP support? Oh, multi-path TCP support. Uh, that's an interesting one, because that's actually, that, that was one of the ones I'm interested in. Not currently, but I'd love to hear more if that's something that's interesting to you, because I know it's heavily used, particularly in cell phones, right, to improve performance and corporate mobility. So if that's something that's interesting, I'd love to talk about it afterwards. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, hopefully next week. <laughs> hopefully next week. Should already be out. Any other questions? No. Thank you. 